So, um, hi, and welcome to Women in Media's first ever panel and networking event, um, the first of 2019 as well. We have some amazing panelists. Um, sitting next to me here is Katrin Nye, who is a BBC journalist and documentary maker. Yomi Adegoke sits next to her. She is also a journalist and co-author of Slay in Your Lane, uh, The Black Girl Bible, which is a best-selling book. Next is Patricia Demesquita, who has over 20 years of experience in the industry, um, specializing in radicalization and political identity. She is a documentary maker. And finally, down the end, is Megan Lucero, who is the director of Bureau Local, and she is a data journalist. So these are four panels. Rhea will also be joining us. She is a freelance presenter and broadcaster. She's been on the likes of ITV and BBC, and she will hopefully pop in at some point. But up until that point, maybe you guys could give us more of an introduction as to what you do. Katrin, do you want to start this off? A bit about what, what I do. Yeah, what, what do you do? Uh, so I have been a journalist uh, for about 15 years now. I started off in local journalism and local radio and then I've sort of moved my way uh, international in the BBC. Uh, I'm currently making a panorama as well as um, kind of shorter, shorter features do a sort of a cross between uh, documentary and standard news, I would say. So slightly longer news and then documentary. Amazing. Yomi, how about you? Um, I've probably been a journalist for substantially less time <laughs> than Catherine, but I'd say maybe about five years. I'd say probably that's probably around the time period I started feeling comfortable calling myself a journalist um, because I'd always referred to myself as a writer because um, my background was essentially I started out blogging um, and sort of writing um, opinion pieces, which I hosted on my own sort of website. Um, so I had no sort of formal training. Um, I studied law at university and um, essentially, I don't like to use the word lucky because I think women do that far too often when we sort of do things that work out, but um, I was lucky <laughs> in terms of, I um, did lots of internships and um, was able to sort of start a career in journalism or that was sort of like opinion journalism and um, lots of columns. Um, and then, so I started a, a now defunct website called Viewpoint News, which was sort of looking for young, diverse talent to sort of write about different issues that were affecting sort of young millennials today um, that like so many jobs in the media um, now doesn't exist anymore as a platform. But um, I went on to Channel 4 News to do some more sort of um, investigative stuff and online like sort of um, digital journalism videos and stuff. And then um, recently co-wrote a book with my best friend um, called Slain Your Lane, The Black Girl Bible, which has meant that now I'm often on the other side and sort of being interviewed rather than interviewing, which has been interesting. But as we speak, I'm sort of doing a lot of freelance work and have a couple of columns. But yeah, that's pretty much my background. Hi, I'm, I'm Patricia de Mesquita, and I'm a documentary maker. I've been a documentary filmmaker for 22 years, and 15 of those years were spent at the BBC's News and Current Affairs Department in London, where I specialized mainly in stories related to political identity and radicalization. So I made a huge number of films looking at Al-Qaeda and Daesh, and I, uh, it was my job to go and interview a lot of political extremists of all persuasions, I mean extreme right, extreme left. Sorry. Sorry. Just and <laughs> sorry. And um, I worked with um, a huge amount of um, presenters like Peter Taylor, like Jane Corbyn, that you might have heard of. And um, we worked on long form documentaries and far shorter documentary films. And my background uh, is also uh, quite complicated. I think we, we all come here with our own stories. And I think those stories uh, influence the kind of journalists we, we, we become and the kind of stories we're interested in telling. Mine is, I was born in Kenya, I lived there for quite a long time, and then my father, who's Brazilian, my mother is Austrian, we moved to Yugoslavia, and then we settled in a tiny little village um, in the Basque country, on the French side of the Basque country, when I was an eight-year-old 
we arrived in this little village at the height of a politically very complicated uh, separatist uh, movement. Um, there was a, um, a ETA, it was the, the Basque separatist organization, or so-called um, freedom fighters for the Basque country, and there was also a militant organization sponsored by uh, the Spanish government illicitly coming into the French side of the border and taking out um, fugitives that were hiding in safe houses. And because I was born an outsider, I had this extraordinary privilege of talking and discussing this a lot with my family, always from the outside looking in and trying to understand who these people were because we had people on all, on all sides of that, of that spectrum. We had people who were sympathizers of ETA in my school. We had um, teachers who were arrested in the middle of lessons who had been smuggling drugs to try to finance the, the operations uh, that ETA was carrying out on the Spanish side of the border. And we had collaterals. We had, I had a f the sister of a friend of mine who got killed um, when a GAL operation, the counter-terrorist operation, went wrong. And I was always interested in asking why. I mean, who were these people whose identity was so reduced to such an extreme narrative um, that I didn't know where I belonged? Um, and I just was fascinated by that. And so I went to study international relations at St. Andrews University, which had a political um, violence department, which was brilliant. And then I did a PhD in London um, that was looking at propaganda and asymmetric warfare in times, of, in times of conflict. And for a long time, I thought I would work in storytelling and cinema. And I worked with all sorts of filmmakers. And then I uh, got quite frustrated with that process. And I found a tiny job working in Yemen as a researcher on a uh, documentary film on the Queen of Sheba for the BBC. And that Yemeni trip happened just a few weeks before 9-11, before the Twin Towers were attacked uh, by Al-Qaeda. And in Yemen, I sat around campfires with extraordinary people, incredible tribal chiefs, mutahideen that had just come back from Afghanistan and Bosnia, and were telling me these stories. And I thought, this is really what I want to do. These, these are the stories I really want to tell. And so I looked at foreign affairs strands in, uh, in, in, uh, in the BBC in particular at the time, and I just picked up the phone and uh, called a editor called Fiona Sturton, a woman who I, I told, you know, I've got a PhD, I speak six languages, I know a little bit about uh, extremist movements, take me on board. And that's how I started, as a researcher moving up the ranks. And I spent 15 years there, and I left four years ago, and that's another story, <laughs> but I'll tell you about it another time. So that's my story. Um, hi, I'm Megan. I'm the director of the Bureau Local. Um, you'll also hear a different accent uh, on me as well. Um, I moved to the UK um, eight years ago to do my master's here in the UK in international journalism. I wanted to be a foreign reporter. Um, I ended up as an intern at the Times Foreign Desk, um, but uh, five years at the Times meant I um, kind of just put my hand in whatever I could. I became one of the first digital journalists. I became one of the first data journalists and the first data editor at the Times and the Sunday Times. Um, I was trying to forge a sort of a new way in helping the Times and the Sunday Times understand computational method as a way of investigating. So the recognition that our world is changing so quickly around us and recognizing the power of technology and digitization in our world, um, I was trying to help the newsroom recognize that for its future. So we were building programmers, coders, statistician teams inside and embedded inside the investigations units. So I worked on the Insight team for the Sunday Times and the investigations units for the Times. We broke stories in sort of um, blood doping in Russia um, Olympics and kind of across the board big kind of big databases and we were looking at how we tell stories through that. So we were really trying to pioneer that space. Um, and that was five years for me at the Times and the Sunday Times. And I recently left two years ago to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which is a nonprofit independent body that investigates issues in the public interest. Um, I'm the director of the Bureau Local, which is the UK branch of this. Um, and the idea is now to try to reimagine what journalism looks like. Um, so I, my work is a lot in change, really, <laughs> change in journalism. Um, and it's sort of how do we rebuild trust in news and how do we rebuild it with local communities? It, like local journalism has hit particularly hard around the world, but in, in the UK in particular. So we built a collaborative network of reporters, citizens, technologists, people on the ground. Um, it's a very grassroots movement. We have around 900 people who participate with us, and we try to hold power to account, um, 
collaboratively. So my team kind of helps with data and evidence, um, but we also have kind of community building that we do on the ground. So we've done stories on cuts to domestic violence, um, homeless deaths. Uh, we found there was no body who was counting how many people homeless people are dying. So we began, um, and now the first ever statistics on homeless deaths in the UK have been published as a result. So that's the kind of work we're doing, um, and that's sort of my journey. Thank you so much. I mean, from what each of you have said, we have such an incredibly diverse and successful panel. Um, my first kind of question just to throw out to you guys would be that the media is notorious for being fairly male dominated, as there are in many kind of industries. So I was wondering what you think are the main problems kind of facing women who are trying to break into this kind of lucrative and diverse field of the media? That's a very big question, I know. <laughs> uh, the, feel free to answer, it's not directed at anyone, just... Like, uh, Megan, for example, when you say data journalism, mm. in my mind, this is terrible, but it, it strikes me as quite a kind of male-dominated yeah. position. Yeah. Um, would you say that? I think, case? obviously, it's a complicated answer. Um, I mean, obviously, if historically, women were the first computers, so when you think about when technology was first invented, it was women who were first computing them, so I like to throw that fact in to remind people of its origins and its power and women's power in, in the space of technology. But obviously the industry changed and it became very uh, male dominated. Um, but I think actually, when you look in the UK, there are, um, I think it's just from this great group solidarity in a, in a space where people didn't quite, I mean, I was particularly given this space because they didn't know what it was, I'll be completely honest. They, they said, we don't know what this data stuff is, someone's gotta do it, um, why don't you just go over there and figure it out? So there was, as soon as they started kind of catching on to it, there was a lot more structure and kind of traditional hierarchies that fell in, but it was quite an experimental role for people who were interested in in learning and taking a bit of risk. Um, actually, my replacement at the Times is a woman, the head of it at The Guardian is a woman. Um, the, yeah, she was all, there was also women journalists in data journalism at the FT. So actually, in the UK and in the US, this is, there's a lot of women that are doing it. I wouldn't say the, the data part isn't necessarily, but the, the broader point about um, women in news, I think, is just, it, it applies across the board. It, it's, a, it's about structures that were in place for a very long time. That you know, I, I think a lot of these issues that, that we face, and I think it's important to recognize, it's not just women, it's about class, it's about race, it's about sexuality, it's about all these intersections of marginalized groups. Um, and I think it's really important as women that we're fighting for intersectionality at every point of that. And those are structural things that our society has to work for. But I think obviously events like this are helping with it. And I think everyone here sort of talked about well, not everyone, I think you were mentioning it, but a woman who helped kind of get into that space, and I think that's been really important as well. Um, I just, I happen to have, you know, um, they were, for me, it was male editors who gave me a chance, um, and then I had the opportunity to kind of give, give other women a chance, but uh, that, was, that was my personal experience. Yeah, 100%, I mean, a lot of people dub 2018 as, as the year of women, whether or not we need a year, that's a different story, but, I guess you could push it further and say it was more the year of diversity. And you looked at the movies, the things that were popular were Black Panther, um, even RuPaul's Drag Race. There was kind of that diversity in every aspect of underrepresented people, I guess. I was wondering if you thought this ha like has changed and whether it's changing quickly enough. Like Patricia, I know you've been in the industry for quite a while. You have lots of experience. Yeah, I w I we were talking about that in the green room, you know, how the BBC as an institution has changed enormously for the last 15 years. When I started, I was one of the only ones, um, we, there were quite a few friends of mine who were producers behind the scenes, but the roles were given mainly, the presenting roles, there was Jane Corbyn, were mainly given to, and there was of course in the newsroom, extraordinary women that I totally ad admire, like Lise Doucette, who's been there for years, and we had all huge, uh, women role models, I mean, you know, Christiana Mampour, Mary Colvin, you know, uh, incredible people, um, Martha Gellhorn, when I was a child, the third wife of, um, of Hemingway. I mean, these were all extraordinary women, and I think in my, in my, in my job, um, working in very hostile environments, in, you know, very remote places, it was actually a huge advantage being a woman. I could get in where no other man could get in. I could get into um, Salafi jihadis kitchens, you know, and speak to their wives. I could talk about the, victi the real victims of a lot of those, those conflicts, which are the women and the children, and no man were, were allowed into those spaces. And as a woman trying to interview, you know, big military leaders or mujahideen even, you, 
the first instinct in a lot of those places is actually to open the door to a woman because a millennia of social socialization still requires these men to be polite. So you, you are this third sex, you know, they don't quite know you're foreign, you're a woman. I was, I played a lot on the fact that I was not British, not American, I was Brazilian, I was from Kenya, you know, I was kind of, I, I played a lot with, with the fact that I was not maybe, that I maybe could understand some of their stories and I got my foot into that door and then I stayed it and in that door, which a lot of men maybe would have found slightly more, more challenging. And so for me it was, Fantastic. Now things have changed enormously, and I, I, I've covered a lot of stories. I've worked with um, quite a lot of producers in places where, of course, you know, you have rape as a, as a you know, uh, the, the reality of uh, sexual violence against women is enormous. ISIS, Daesh has changed a lot of the, the, the playing field for women in the field, but not only for, for women, for men as well. Being a journalist today is super dangerous. 52 journalists got killed last year just for doing their job. You know, we all so. It's, as you said, it's not just about women, it's also, in general, journalism is, is on the front line on, in all sorts of aspects. That, that's so strange you would say. I would expect from you kind of traveling the world, there are a lot of countries where women have very, very few rights at all. So I wouldn't expect you to be able to kind of get into all those spaces. But, but, but yes, but it depends how you do it. You know, I was super lucky at the time, the BBC, I don't know if it's the same for you, Catherine, because I haven't been there for four years now. I mean, I've worked on, on projects as a freelancer, but um, we had a bit of money to go in a, on a recce. We were allowed to go in before the crew. I, I traveled on my own without a camera, uh, with extraordinary local knowledge um, fixers on the ground. That, and I just went in to try to get those people's stories. And because I try to understand, I mean, you know, like every journalist, you just go in and you try to, to you know, persuade people to talk to you. And it's a, an incredible privilege. And some people, you know, just, just opened their door. And I suppose it's also how much you prepare. You have risk assessments. You have extraordinary hostile environment training. You know, what, you know your, your brief inside out. And Was there ever a time where anything went drastically wrong? No, but there were moments that were very, very <laughs> difficult, you know, but not what you think would happen. I mean, I, I, had, I had more moments where I thought, oh, what am I doing, you know, in, in, in Paris, in some of the suburbs of Paris, which are, you know, much more difficult <laughs> to operate in sometimes than small places in, in Iraq for, for very, a variety of other reasons, because you're not quite prepared for, to the hostility, etc. Um, I was with Jeremy Bowen doing the documentary we were in Sarajevo and, and I had straight to take a shot in a place where there were still mines, mine, you know, mines in the ground. So there, 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 yes, there were, there were moments that were hairy, but um, I just thought, you know, uh, y y y yeah. <laughs> there were moments where you were with paramilitary groups with hand, with hand grenades and guns and something could go terribly wrong and I'm very lucky that nothing did or you could get kidnapped. And I've got friends where, where that happened. Or I've got friends, you know, you, you always, you, you go to hotel rooms and you make sure, I'm sure that's the same with you, Catherine. I don't know how many places you've been to. You, you, I, you travel with your doorstop and you put it on this side of the door, you know, so that during the middle of the night you don't have someone who might be coming in. But have you ever had an experience like that, Catherine? I haven't, I haven't had a doorstop moment, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would agree that on the road, um, being a woman hasn't uh, hasn't really been a problem, uh, and I've probably not been to quite so many dangerous spots. But I've reported from Iraq and um, done a lot recently from the Syrian border, at least not been able to go into Syria. And it's and being a woman hasn't been a problem, but I would agree with Megan when it comes to organisations and um, be it a, you know different parts of the BBC or a newspaper or various all the different media organizations that exist now that if we don't have diverse staff bases in all those different ways you just are not going to attract everyone to work there like even myself and I'm not going to name names but there are bits of the BBC that over the years I haven't wanted to work in because I don't feel like I fit there and you know, if you're a woman, why would you want to work somewhere where it's all men? If you're working class, why would you want to work every, somewhere where 
and, and there's a good reason, you know, if you're working class to go and work somewhere where everyone is posh, for want of a better word, but you're just not going to feel comfortable. If you're black, you're going to look at a place where everyone's white and be like, oh, that's just not for me. And I think that is really important. And I definitely feel like even if I haven't wanted to in my career, I've probably, because um, I, you know, I grew up on free school meals in a single parent family and sort of there were bits of the BBC that I was just like, oh, I'm not quite the right fit for there. Or there were other organizations that I was like, oh, I'm not quite, just maybe they're just not my kind of people or I'm not going to get on with everyone or I'm not going to feel comfortable doing my thing. And that's really actually different from being out in the real world because the real world is really diverse and the people you interview are from every background because you know stories come from absolutely everywhere so i would definitely say it's kind of internally rather than externally where whatever the category is that you fit into be that um, a class category or race category or female or, or sexuality or whatever it's within organizations that it's felt like probably more of a barrier i think it comes back down to that idea of role models if you have people in the spheres that you want to go into that look like you you think that you can make it, it makes it more attainable. Um, I know that's something you spoke about quite a lot in your book, Yomi, about kind of positive role models and good representation. Yeah, and I think I'm just going off what Catherine was talking about in terms of um, not seeing yourself reflected in certain spaces and newsrooms and organizations genuinely just makes you feel like it's not somewhere you're supposed to be, even if it is somewhere that you need to be. And I don't feel like the owner should be on aspiring journalists to kind of look past what they're seeing and force themselves into spaces where they don't feel welcome. I think also in terms of the sort of um, space that journalism is in right now, I think that I've got sort of two points. Firstly, it's important that we look at the roles that people are actually being hired in. So in terms of um, sort of permanent staff, um, I'd say even senior roles, um, I can honestly say that throughout the vast majority of my career, I've very rarely worked with somebody from the same background as me. So that's, um, you know, I'm from Croydon, I'm black, I'm female, and I'm young. And the vast majority of people that I have worked with have been, you know, predominantly quite middle to upper working class, um, you know, privately educated and male. And I guess I'm in the same position as Megan where I've sort of been put on or looked after by a lot of sort of men that are from very different backgrounds to me because essentially there were no other sort of black women or women of color or just women generally in senior positions that were able to sort of give me opportunities so i've often had to look at allies that um don't necessarily reflect my like background but have just sort of essentially taken a shine to me um but yeah i think it's really important to sort of look at the positions that you know, people from diverse backgrounds are actually being hired in because I think what we're seeing because diversity is trending, as I always sort of say, um, we are getting a sort of spate of articles and op-eds and features on black culture. And now we're in a position where we're actually sort of getting black writers to actually sort of talk about our own experiences and community, communities, sorry. But when you sort of delve a little bit deeper, most of the time those um, journalists are freelance or they're in precarious sort of, working contracts, they're very rarely sort of staff writers that are um, in positions where they can sort of affect change. And I think with the kind of round of, of as most people are probably aware of, the round of cuts that's been going on in sort of any kind of, most kind of um, digital platforms, um, someone on Twitter actually was saying that it's often young minority reporters, especially female ones that are kind of the, is the phrase the canary in the mine or whatever? I've forgotten what the phrase is, where something is kind of, how do I put it? Somebody must know this phrase. I've heard that phrase. <laughs> the canary in the whole mind or something, where there's a, where essentially... Put into tests. Yeah, exactly. They're essentially the, they're the ones that kind of go first, essentially. They're the ones that kind of show you what's going to happen, which is essentially that minority female journalists um, tend to sort of be the ones that feel the brunt of those kind of cunts and... Re cunt? Oh, my God. <laughs> Sorry. I meant cuts. But I said so. Sorry. We were waiting for that one. I'm glad wow, you it. that was very unfortunate. I meant cut <laughs> I think and it was redundancies. <laughs> Jesus it's okay. Christ! It's a Monday. It's Sorry. Monday. Yeah, and I'm very tired. But yes, <laughs> that livened everybody up a bit. Um, yeah, cuts and redundancies. <laughs> 
Um, they're essentially the first people that tend to be disposable. Not, it's not like they're being made redundant because they're black and because they're women, but it's often because they're in the roles that are most junior, they're in um, apprenticeship roles, they're in um, you know, internship roles, they're in junior roles. So it's most likely that they'll be the ones that sort of get rid of, that are gotten rid of first. And um, my second point, aside from looking at, you know, staff roles and where people are sort of being hired and why, it's sort of also about the importance of looking at, again, I suppose, diversifying what positions people are um, employed in because I suppose it's a really difficult kind of conversation to have, I suppose, but as somebody that's written, like, writes specifically about my identity, I don't think um, often, unless you kind of are in a particular community, you're aware of how important, for instance, something like sub-editors and like just general editors are when you're sort of trying to edit somebody's, a piece on a very specific topic that doesn't necessarily pertain to you. And I think the lack of sort of like black sub-editors and editors generally is something that probably, and just generally um, ethnic minority and female editors is something that I don't think people necessarily notice because the mistakes that are made are ones that only kind of speak to a particular demographic. A perfect example would be that um, I, um, this has happened to me like a million times, but I've written several pieces where, you know, the content of the article has been completely sort of fine and no one's had any issue with it, but it's been given a sort of particularly, and I know that, and again, this is something that female journalists of any color can often experience, um, but then it's experienced in a very specific way within like the black community or for women of color. I've written articles that have been given really sort of specifically um, clickbaity, but then more sort of race baity titles that have quite literally put me in danger because um, I guess to a white editor, it's not been immediately obvious that writing a particular headline would sort of attract sort of racist trolls to me because they're seeing it as sort of summarizing a general point that I'm making, but they're not necessarily aware of that nuance. But then also there've been times where I've been given sort of a headline that, a quick example, um, I wrote a piece um, which was about um, a sort of burgeoning musical like renaissance that's taking place in the UK and how it's very heavily sort of um, influenced by the black community and black culture. Um, and the piece was sort of headlined, um, you know, meet the sort of black British musicians that are kind of shaping the musical landscape at the moment. But I'd say maybe two of the musicians were actually black and the rest of them were from sort of different backgrounds and ethnicities. And I think um, the problem was that the editor had essentially just thought, well, you know, this is influenced by black music, so re and they're all ethnically ambiguous, so calling them black or referencing them to them as black isn't an issue. But then, to, I guess, the wider white community, it wasn't necessarily an immediate issue. But for me, on sort of, you know, with platforms like Twitter and sort of like, you know, black Twitter, which is a very sort of vocal, um, you know, groups, group online, um, they obviously took massive offense to it, an offense that then was, you know, became my problem because um, they didn't necessarily realize that I hadn't okayed or written that headline. So it became, you know, a big argument about using the term black to refer to people that were BAME or Asian or from a different background. And then that was sort of stuff that I had to deal with on my own. And I think just even in terms of use of like slang and just, I've been, I've had slang corrected. I've had it sort of taken out and changed so the meaning of a sentence has changed that then I'm sort of dealing, taking the flack from when that's wrong. And I think um, every time it happens, which is very often, and it's something lots and lots of um, journalists of color particularly sort of talk about, it ends up sort of just bringing up the same question of how are black and minority ethnic people being employed in what capacity if, if we're only sort of employing minorities to speak about their specific experience, like, okay, Beyonce's done something, we need, we're scrambling for a black woman to write about it, then it becomes that, you know, on a kind of institutional level, mistakes that are made kind of go unnoted because I think we've got, at the moment, because diversity is popular, we're getting a lot of like sort of one-off op-eds about certain things, but not actual sort of institutional change. It's still, last time I checked, journalism was 94% white, and I don't think it's- 55% male. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and I don't think this is statistics that in the face of kind of like conversations about women and conversations about diversity in terms of ethnicity, I don't think it's changed that much, but we're, we're definitely getting a difference in terms of content, but not necessarily in terms of like sort of institutional change. I'm just going to interrupt the the um, discussion for a second. Hi, Ria. Hi, guys. Sorry, I'm late. 
I'm that token person. <laughs> Don't judge me. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We'll just sub in and out. It's like a tag team. <laughs> so we've just basically been introducing everyone. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm a presenter and I'm a broadcaster and I'm also a producer too. Um, passionate about diversity, celebrating women and inspiring the next generation. Um, I always knew I wanted to work in television from being six years old. It's just something that I always wanted to do. Um, I'm originally from West Yorkshire. Any northern people here? Yay, big up the north. I was actually born in London. I was born in uh, Hackney, but raised in Yorkshire. And uh, yeah, I always knew I wanted to work in telly. So when I moved back to London when I was 10, um, I studied media at college. I studied film and television at university. I went to Brunel. And I actually had to take a day off uh, work to graduate because I'd already set up my job before I'd graduated. So always very tenacious, always very driven. But I learned very quickly that in media and telly, at the time it was very clicky, it's all who you know. If your mates, dad or mum's already in the industry, they could give you a heads up to get your CV in. Um, it's nice to think that things are changing now, but I have always been a bit of a grafter, I've always had a really good work ethic. Um, I wasn't too sure what kind of area I wanted to start off in, so I pursued production for the first couple of years, and then, because I liked to write, I went into publicity, where I ended up working for 20th Century Fox, Channel 4 in their entertainment uh, press team, Discovery Channel, and then Disney, where I headed up uh, live events for the whole of EMEA and the UK. Um, but all the while, in my heart, I kind of knew I wasn't really doing what I wanted to do, which was presenting. So while I was in those publicity roles, I built up a showreel on the side, going to events, getting access to red carpet awards dues and covering events and things like that to build up that portfolio of work. And then I just kind of, it hit me. I'd been at Disney about three years and I just thought, you know what, if you don't take that leap and just believe in yourself 100%, you'll never do it and you just have to do it. Like what's the worst that can happen? You give it a go, it doesn't work out, you can fall back on your PR career. And I, I did it, and it was really, really hard. I, I won't lie to you, going from a really well-paid, well stable job with amazing benefits to freelancing and literally having to create your own workload, you know? Cre all about nurturing relationships and building your network. But I, I'm proud to say that because I focused you know, with 110%, I've done really well. And, you know, last year for me was a real highlight. I, I um, presented on This Morning on ITV, couple of times and I also did Sunday Morning Live which is a religion and ethics show for the BBC which is really great and that's you know covering stories I did a whole piece on mental health and raising awareness around mental health in the in that week and um, it got a lot of traction across the country which is amazing because it's a really important issue and it's very topical I'm sure you've all written about it recently but um, that program was very powerful because in speaking to different people in Manchester about how mental health issues have affected them directly or maybe through people that they know, you realise in that moment how important this issue is actually and how much it actually really connects all of us. So that's my kind of highlight of last year. And yeah, I'm proud to say I'll be working some more with BBC this year and with ITV. So yeah, that's my story. So it's okay if you're not quite clear on what kind of route you want to be in in journalism and media. It can change as you evolve and as you grow and as you experience different people and different companies. But if you ever get that niggle and you, you know that you're not really doing what you want to do, I'd say listen to the niggle and go for the leap. We were, um, just before you came in, we were talking about kind of representation mm -hmm. um, and kind of how women have been notoriously underrepresented, also ethnic minorities. We also touched on people from different sexualities, non people that aren't straight basically and how that's kind of changed in 2018 we're slowly seeing some progression we've got black panther and i think i said rupaul's drag race is also really oh, big i love rupaul <laughs> did anyone see gender quake on channel four gender quake gender quake now that was yeah. fascinating because it was a bit like big brother they put 10 different people in a house together for a week but they all identified their sexuality and identity completely differently so you had lots of people we had three that were non-binary one that was solely heterosexual a few that were gay and a few that were transgender and some had had the op and some hadn't and it was fascinating just how they all kind of categorized themselves 
and, and just the issues that came up. If you can catch up on, I think it's all four or something, it's a really interesting ex social experiment and just gets you thinking differently about how you view other people. Well, th that's kind of the thing we were talking about, how um, I guess before kind of 2018 and previous years, there hasn't been a lot of kind of representation and it's difficult to aspire to something when you don't relate to it and you don't see yourself being that. Um, I remember when I was studying for my dissertation last year, I was reading an article about fairy tales and a psychologist did this experiment where she sat these children down and she read them a fairy tale story. And afterwards she asked all of them to draw the protagonist, the princess, and every single child, like every single one, drew a blonde-haired white princess, even if they weren't blonde-haired or white themselves, um, which is obviously like hugely problematic. Um, so I was wondering in terms of kind of representation, who, who your role model kind of was, who, who do you look up to? Because presenting, like it's so, so difficult to get into. So I was just wondering what you, who you draw on for inspiration. My inspiration, weirdly enough, w it was June Sarprong, who, which was really nice actually, because on Sunday Morning Live, um, we had the rap party and she was there. And I said, it's just so amazing that I grew up watching you on T4 and you inspired me to just go for it. And here we are on the same show, on the same series, you know, just kind of talking about how far we've all come. So that felt like we'd gone full circle. So, yeah, visibility is so, so important. And that's something that I talk a lot about at different events and stuff. Because I think if you don't see yourself in others, you it, it kind of unconsciously believe that those things aren't possible or attainable for yourself. So it's really, really important that you have diversity in all sectors, on all levels, so that, you know, you're really dreaming and thinking big and going for it. I think something that's being spoken about quite a lot, and it's something I definitely feel, and I know a load of my friends feel the same, is that idea of imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. that you're not good enough to be somewhere, and even if you do get somewhere, you feel like you don't belong there. Um, I was just wondering... That will never stop. Oh. <laughs> Great. <laughs> never Sorry. stop. No, 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 it's almost good that, like, it's not just you. You know it's not just you who feels that way. I mean, it's something that's notorious, I guess, amongst women, it seems like a lot of women feel that way, but I guess just amongst maybe even young people, I was wondering if you guys had any examples of that and how you combat it, really. No, uh, my, my big thing, I mean, you know, I, I don't know, I see my parents, you know, although they raised me, you know, there was, uh, they, you know, go for it. I was, I was raised all over the world and, and they always thought there was not a single narrative for me or a single story that would, you know, I was, um, I was still raised never to put myself forward. I have a huge problems. I don't have any socials right now. I mean, I know I'm, I'm setting up my own little project and I know I will have to go on, but this comes as a really hard, I mean, just sitting here in front of you, I've been to hostile environments, I've interviewed, you know, extremists. Uh, I've <laughs> I still find this really daunting because I feel, oh God, these people are amazing. You're all amazing, you know, <laughs> who am I? I mean, this is something I think that is sometimes ingrained you know, you're so conditioned by your parents, you know, just don't talk about yourself, you know, look at, talk about the others. As a journalist, you ask questions. You're not the one who is asked questions. And I've got identical twins. I mean, I know you, I don't know if you, some of your parents, and this was revolutionary for me, you know, to have these two little girls, and I, I'm, I'm now, um, I quit the BBC four years ago, and I'm doing a bit of freelancing, but I, I, I started with four other friends. We are, um, we, founded a news and journalism um, club for uh, primary school kids from the age of 8 till 12. Uh, we've started in four schools in London. We've got two schools in Rwanda. We've got one school in, in Turkey. We've got one in Tajikistan, a couple in Kenya that are opening, where kids from the age of 8 who, from any persuasion, any background, and state school kids in this country, you know, where my kids in a state school don't really have a platform where they can ask questions about the world around them, you know, and exactly that, the fairy tales. You know, now, thank goodness, we have books like, you know, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls and all sorts of extraordinary stories. But where, where are these narratives, you know? I grew up uh, my, um, in Kenya, you know, with Samburus and my Aya was Zulu and my, the stories she told me were completely different to those kind of Rapunzel waiting for the man to <laughs> save her. But my kids, I want them, you know, to be able to enter any room and feel they have a voice 
and feel that they belong to that democratic process as well, you know, to be curious with confidence and never stop asking these questions. And I, I, I think, you know, we still have a long way to go, mm. but it's changing, you know, and all these years at the BBC because I was foreign, because, I, you know, I went to British Uni, but um, I, was, I was not, you know, my, my English was not as good as those of the guys who were mainly Oxbridge educated men, and they're little, you know, microaggressions as you talk about them that happen, uh, that still, that always knock down your confidence. So you always have this imposter syndrome, which I'm trying to kind of de-program de my kids, you know, <laughs> from. So. But to be, to just to chime in, you know, the fact that you speak different languages is such an asset. I mean, that will open up opportunities for you work-wise, no? Oh, it, it totally has, yeah. you know, it, and this was my kind of calling card because I'm, I, I was a specialist in, in radicalization and political identity for years, so I spoke six languages, so I could go everywhere. But in my family, everyone spoke six languages and you don't talk about it, you know? Don't put yourself forward, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah, I know. It's an interesting one because all of, you know, everyone here, is unique mm. and we bring to the table as journalists our unique story but sometimes we're so you know in awe of others that are much more you know much more capable of talking very well you know i watched all you guys on youtube and i was like oh you know <laughs> look at you so eloquent <laughs> so it doesn't you know it doesn't just end there yeah i think i think when it comes to imposter syndrome you do just have to kind of, and I don't know if everyone agrees, like push through it. Mm. Like, I, I don't, I, I don't feel like you can completely get rid of it unless you have some unbelievably inbuilt confidence, which I definitely don't have. And, and probably the same as you, we often look at other people and presume they've got it when actually they're just pushing through it as well. Mm. Like at the start of my career, I, I started off as a reporter in local radio, like I said, and sort of climbed up through the various organizations that you have to. And I went from local radio to Radio One and One Extra and Asian Network, which were all youth radio stations. So it still sort of felt appropriate for me, like at that time, because um, I was quite young and, and, the, and the material was quite familiar. And I always had this in my head when I was, you know, my early 20s, like one day I was sort of looking up and thinking, oh, one day I'll report for somewhere like Newsnight, maybe, because Newsnight was huge and big and where kind of amazing journalists and reporters were. And then um, when I was still working at Asian Network, I, I got this role uh, with uh, some other reporters. There was sort of a group of us whose job was to try and take our stories around the rest of the BBC. And I had what was an amazing boss, and often this is the way. Uh, I took an idea to him. I'd said, oh, I've got this idea for a story. I don't know if it's interesting. <laughs> it might not be very interesting. No one cares, I'm sure. Uh, and like took it to him, and he was like, that's amazing. News and I will love that. Let's go and see them. And I was like, are you mad? Like, I can't go in there. I and he basically sort of arranged the meeting and marched me into the room with an editor who I'll always love, a woman called Jasmine Butter, who used to be the editor of Newsnight, or deputy editor maybe, uh, and sat me down and I explained the idea. And she loved it and she commissioned it for a series. So not just like one report, a series of reports. And I'm there going, mm -hmm, yeah, and we're going to do this and we're going to get this. Okay, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And she commissioned it and I went home, and this is really embarrassing, but we're sharing. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I cried because <laughs> I was like, I can't do it. There's no way. So I'd gone in, got the commission, been what I felt was an imposter, done the thing, had the story, still cried. <laughs> and I was just like on my bed with my boyfriend at the time going, no way, no way can I do this. <laughs> but obviously got over the crying, stood up and went and did it. And so I think, I just, I just think that feeling of being overwhelmed or out of place, um, I was very young there and that was a huge achievement and now I don't cry when I get a commission that I think is difficult but I still feel nervous and like you say you know we all said before we came on here sort of made a joke about being on a panel because we're all Yomi's more experienced because she's written a book and so she gets questions so much but like 
when natural question asked it asked sorry and yeah i still said cunt like <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> so still, even if you ask questions every day that can still happen <laughs> like i think you you always be amazed that wherever someone places themselves they don't necessarily feel completely at home and completely confident they're just going right i'm gonna do it anyway um, just to add to that, yeah, I was going to say, um, I know I bring everything sort of back to representation, but I think, again, a part of the reason that um, imposter sy syndrome, at least for me, manifests in a particular way is because I know that when people think of a journalist, they don't think of somebody that looks like me necessarily or someone that's from my background to the point where, quite honestly, if I go out to like a club and I meet, you know, there have been times where someone's sort of chatted me up and been like, so what do you do? And I immediately kind of hesitate to say I'm a journalist, I'm an author, because it just raises so many questions in terms of, but how, but wh like what kind of, like how, like I think people, and that's people from all different backgrounds are so kind of surprised by what I do for a living, not because, I think obviously it's quite an interesting profession anyway, but I think just because I know mentally that's not what they kind of imagine a journalist to necessarily look like, especially like when I go out sort of in my hometown, like Croydon Box Park, and it's like, oh yeah, I've just co-written this book with my best friend. It's like, okay, wait, so let's go to the beginning as to how that happened kind of thing. And I think, yeah, for a long time, despite me having an older sister that's a massively successful journalist who's done amazingly who quite literally looks exactly like me i still couldn't see myself in a journalist because it's just not something that i think many people necessarily feel is for them because of what it's the same way when you kind of say neurosurgeon like doctor lawyer whatever you get a, it doesn't matter who you are you kind of have this default V version of who you think occupies that space and that's why it's so important to kind of try and show people that you know um anyone like any any profession like you know there's not a particular person that has to look a particular way or be a particular way to sort of work in whatever sort of industry um and i guess in terms of like battling um imposter syndrome like it's definitely something that i think anybody and everyone sort of suffers from in different ways and to different degrees and i think once you kind of realize that i think there's a phrase that says something like everybody's just there was a picture actually on twitter that had a picture of um it was like barack obama looking like massively suave and someone had captioned it once you kind of realize that even he too is faking it <laughs> And that he too is like trying to sort of like just make it to the end of the day it makes it a lot easier to kind of just get on with things and i think um honestly at times when i feel sort of you know like why am i here who am i i kind of try to like literally just keep a track of what it is uh, as to why i am here so what i did to get myself to this position like i read my linkedin a lot <laughs> which sounds really silly but i do like to go back on my linkedin and be like yeah i did actually do this thing and like i completely forgotten it i i you know have massive a massively supportive group of friends that will remind me that i've done certain things but it is often you know important to like for lack of a better phrase like keep receipts and just sort of go back over what it is that you've done because it can be very easy especially with things like microaggressions to have those things that you've done be invalidated, especially if you, the amount of times that me and my best friend um, have gone, you know, we've been sort of headline speakers at events and we've gone to um, reception and they've been like, guys, sorry, the door's not open yet. You know, you've got to wait in the queue. And we're like, no, no, we're the headline speakers. And they're like literally speaking over us being like, oh, you've just got to stand over there. And we're like, no, 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 we're, we're the, <laughs> we've got to go into the green room. And it's like, you know, the amount of time it takes for people to kind of calibrate to the idea that like, no, we actually are here to speak. Um, those kind of things can on like a daily basis, like make you feel invalidated. So it is important for you to kind of validate yourself and it can be corny to kind of have a journal where you're like documenting what is that you've done but you know i think it is important that we kind of look over what it is that we've done to get to where we are and like celebrate it especially because you know as brits we're so kind of like hesitant to do that and so kind of like you know almost proud of our inability to be proud <laughs> so yeah i think it's it's i think that definitely if i didn't keep reminding myself that like i deserve to be in certain spaces i probably would have a breakdown so yeah but also remember you got yourself there you put yeah. the work in you earned your space there yeah i think as much as it's important to do goal setting it's also important to keep track of your achievements as they happen I, this might sound cheesy i don't care but i do it and it, it works for me i write at the start of every week this is what i'm going to do this week and as a column this is what i did and every single week, there's always so much more that I did 
than what I set myself. And so, you know, I might hit some goals, I might miss some goals, but when I'm feeling down, I'll flick through those sheets and I'll impress myself and I'm proud because I know what I'm doing. I know there's hundreds of tiny, tiny little steps that I do every day to get me that little bit close to the bigger goals. So that's really important. And having a why is so important. Having a why you want to be here, why you want to do what you want to do, why it's important to you. Why, why do you want to jump out of bed every day? Your why is so the thing that is going to keep you motivated through all the setbacks and the knockbacks and everything that will happen in life. So have your why written out somewhere that you will see it every single day. My poor husband sees it every single day. <laughs> when I open my wardrobe, I'm like, there's my 15 reasons why. But it really does work, you know, and it's important that you set yourself goals and, and look after your own well-being because this industry is incredibly competitive. Mm. The hours that you put in are re really demanding. For those of you that have children, you know, there are going to be sacrifices for your career. But again, you will make them because you'll go back to your why. I was just going to quickly add to both of your points. Um, just as, as it might be useful. Um, one is your point about Britishness. I think I brought a bit of American, <laughs> Californian. Um, we're into my work when I went to the Times and it kind of, kind of comes back to what you're saying about value. I think I look back at my five years at the Times and it's sort of crazy blackout as if I didn't remember it was there. But I was, I was sort of in a state of desperation. I, I, did, I, was, I was so desperate for a job. I, I was hungry to be in there and it, it and maybe there was this like, you know, inner Californian, um, half of it might have been the confidence and the assurance of it, but half of it was really just to get there, which, you know, I started as an intern. I was paid um, for, se for seven months to be that intern, and then they decided they weren't going to pay interns anymore. And I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't lose my job that was paying me <laughs> nothing. Um, so I wrote to the editor, and I pitched a job to him to say, I want to, I want to, you need to be doing more of this. Here's the stuff I was doing for you. It's going to stop if I leave you need to employ me. Um, surprisingly, they listened to it. They gave me a job. I created my own role. That job came up for the axe again. And I kind of just basically kept plunging through that the entire time that I was there. And I think half of it is, like you said, you're in this state of just, I have to survive. And I think if you think, if I look back now and saying, okay, a lot of that was just a survival mode, but I, but I think a lot of that comes back to, it was always asserting my value. I remember and finding out that people on my same level were men that were paid far more than me. Um, and I went into that room and um, I was shaking, but I you know, went into that room saying, you know, this isn't right, I want to be paid different. And they did the normal, oh, well, our budget, you know, everything's been cut. And just, ha you know, of course, you can't come from an emotional state, you have to come from this logical state of assurance. But um, being able to tell them, you know, it, this doesn't make sense. Your budget is so big, but my value doesn't change and this is what I'm worth. And you know this is what I'm worth because you're paying the same role for this worth. And to be able to say, how do you defend that against it? To kind of, you kind of coming with this, like I said, your value is always at the front of it. And knowing that as journalists, if we just return back to that, there's a story and a value in every single person and you're always seeking that when you're telling it. And to remind yourself that you have that, that you have so much value. I see it every time when we look at sort of interns or, or new people studying in journalism that I would, you know, I would kill to be able to, to read their story about where they came from or, or what they're going through because actually that's desperately what our industry needs right now. They need real stories that are attached to real people. And if you bring that to your work, you bring your value and you put it forward every day, it's going to be scary. <laughs> it's going to be a bit, um, ner you know, nerve-wracking. But I think by the end of it, I think all my bosses joked by the end that I was just this great, you know, I think at one point, you do your performance review, um, and I thought it was a two-way street. I thought I'd review my bosses. They didn't know about that, um, and they joked about that on my, leave, on my leaving day that um, they told everyone that I had reviewed them on my first performance review. Um, but, but it's true, if you kind of go, you go in with what your values and know what you expect out of it, and I, I expected a, a working relationship to be two ways. Um, I look back now at how like, naive and crazy I was, but I think so much of that, if we kind of, if like I said, you hold that with you going forward, that would be my advice. Yeah, I was thinking that was how maybe we could end it if we could just go down the line. I feel like Megan already gave us a little piece of advice, but just a short piece of advice for the people here on how to how to be successful and happy in being that, so that was a happy. lot deeper than I was planning. <laughs> how to how to, how to be happy. Just a piece of advice, I think, <laughs> more generally. Uh, oh God, one one piece. If there's something that you would have liked to have known maybe when you started your career. We could start down the other end. I can put the pressure on Rhea if you prefer. <laughs> I suppose I would say 
we're at such an, an advantage nowadays with LinkedIn and with Twitter and social media flat platforms. You've got access to really quite senior people in businesses that you would never get the opportunity to connect with 10, 15 years ago. So I would say be really tenacious and just go for it. Approach people that you admire, that you'd love to work with, or if they've written something that really inspired you, reach out to them and, you know, say, is there any way at all I could shadow you? Or just, you know, because I get people asking me all the time if they can come on shows and stuff, and if I can, I'll bring them with me. If I can't, I'll, you know, I'll speak to them on the phone. Approach people that you admire because most people will make time to help the next generation because it, everyone has that responsibility to do that. So if you, know, if you see someone that you admire, you, you're following their work, reach out to them, just go for it. Um, I think I would just I would build on what I said before about holding your value, but also kind of emphasize what you mentioned earlier about sort of about your why. I see so many young people come, come forward and want to be X thing. And I think, I, I think the only way I personally made it, and people I see around me who make it, is when you have a dry, you have that driving passion towards that, and those are the people that I've seen succeed because you're not trying to be something that is sort of in your head what you think it's meant to be. And I found myself even doing that early on as well, of thinking, well, that's what I sh what I should be or what I should be aspiring to. But the more you sort of deep down what you're truly interested in, and you 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 really drive and innovate your solution, whether that's a topic area, whether that's a, a way of working, whether that's a platform, whatever that is. And I think those those avenues of passion um, are gonna what ma what makes you distinct. When I look at people that I hire, uh, that's really what stands out to me are, are people that just have this driving passion for something and have, and have been so creative and innovative in the way that they do that. And I think that that's what stands apart for me. Um, <laughs> you've said a lot already that I, I, I think as well, I mean, kindness, empathy as a journalist, um, standing your grounds, but also not fearing, sometimes learning along, I mean, constantly learn. Don't be afraid sometimes you might want to see, or you see these extraordinary presenters or these extraordinary producers, but if you start at the bottom, like I did, you know, frothing cappuccino, punching holes, that too is quite will one day be extraordinarily valuable when you go out there. You know, don't, don't rush, don't rush, learn, and, um, and yeah, and, and be, be kind, and, and, and always, always beware of echo chambers, and people who just emphasize your own thoughts. Always, you know, test yourself against those, because it's quite easy to, you know, especially in journalism, especially in, in the West, <laughs> you know, people are all liberals, and, you know, most of them are. I mean, just test sometimes, just go out there and talk to people, all the time talk to people that you have nothing, perhaps, values in common with, and just reassess yourself, so compassion, kindness, and, and humility sometimes. Yes, that was amazing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, I think, yeah, I just want to kind of reassert Megan's point about um, um, value. And I think um, pretty much the way my career started was seeing value in what, I guess, society at large didn't see value in. So I think it's so interesting and bizarre to me to see, you know, how kind of British culture now is dominated by kind of stories about inner city, like working class black youth, things like grime, chicken chops, stuff that I used to like essentially blog about because that was my immediate reality, but nobody cared because it wasn't sort of dominating the culture and it was kind of like in the sidelines of society, but that was my immediate sort of lived reality, the lived reality of my friends and family. So I just wrote about what I knew and um, to be honest, I was often encouraged not to. I think especially as um, women generally, we're, re we're always kind of, in, there's a real kind of trend in terms of like women's journalism to kind of encourage people to write really kind of like gut-wrenching personal pieces about, you know, like really horrific life experiences. And that's the only way you can make it as a woman in journalism, especially with the kind of writing I do, which is like often opinion and personal and, um, sort of like, yeah, o lots of op-eds and columns. Um, but I was always like, that's not what I want to do. I don't want to necessarily write about my personal life. I want to write about the things that, th the sort of stories that matter to me and matter to my friends. And um, as I said, up until very recently, it's not been something that um, so society, papers, or anybody's necessarily particularly cared about. And um, when they did start caring about it, they often sort of would employ people from outside of the community to write about things incorrectly. Um, so once you kind of start to see that value and not 
deviate from the fact that everybody's writing about one thing or focusing on one thing and you kind of come into your own into your own niches and what matters to you um you can really kind of dominate that field and sort of do so authentically and i think um yeah it's just kind of about not necessarily chasing trends and trying to sort of just you know all stories matter and i know that sounds really kind of cliche and corny but it's true like it's it's not as though you know grime is something that you know started and you know became like came into being in the past sort of four years but if you're somebody that like gets all their information from just you know like whatever newspaper you'd honestly think that but it's something that's been around for like literally decades at this point and um i think you know just trying to sort of hone in on what matters to you um especially if it doesn't matter to a lot of people is actually far more important than just kind of like chasing whatever's out there and also just of what you were saying about empathy and just humility um, and eco chambers. Yeah, I always say to people, don't do cliques. <laughs> like, um, I think Zadie Smith said it that you know, cliques and gangs don't make your writing any better. And I think that's absolutely true, especially with things like social media. You can really be like, look at all these people with their blue ticks and they're atting each other and they're all friends. I've got to go drinking with them. You really don't have to. <laughs> you can just do your own thing. And you know, if you're good, like it's going to speak for itself. You really don't. I think yeah, it's an industry that does encourage at times a lot of kind of like fake friendships and forced relationships. And I honestly really don't feel that, you know, if you work hard, I just don't believe it's necessary. Just do your own thing. I'm gonna agree with a lot of points. There's some good stuff here. Um, I would say uh, on the happiness front, uh, figuring out what you like, definitely. Like I've always been a broadcast journalist, a radio and TV, and that's a lot of different things. You know, journalism is not one thing. There's a million different kinds. And even within that, it was like, oh, you can be a newsreader, you can be a TV presenter, you can uh, front a show, or you can be out reporting, or you can be, that's a lot of different things. And I figured out quite early on that what I really liked was finding my own stories from people, digging into them and doing original news. And I really didn't like standing in front of an existing news story and talking about this is this is maybe career suicide, isn't it? But you know, like you know, if there's a if there's a big event, I didn't enjoy being the person standing in front of the camera talking about something that was just happening. I wanted to go and find it myself. And you'll always get opportunities in your job to do the other stuff. And so you should definitely try it. I did producing, um, I did like news reading, bulletin reading, which again, when I was really young, I was like, oh, that's really cool being the news reader. That's really cool. And I just didn't like it. Um, I was a bit confused by that, but once you've realized what you like and you keep doing it, it do definitely does make you happier. Um, another piece of advice on pitching, which I also, I feel like I figured out quite early and have always carried it with me, is that stories within journalism are currency, and if you have a great story, you've just got to keep pushing with it and keep bugging editors with it. and. I always say you also have to kind of have no shame because editors are busy and they ignore you and then you have to email again and again and again and then be like, hey, <laughs> here's my idea. Have you seen it yet? Because if you have a good idea, someone will want it. And early in your career, you'll have people, um, I don't know if you guys had this sort of steal stories off you. Oh They're like, yeah. great idea. Someone else is going to do that. And I, had to, I felt like I put up with that for a bit. And then after a while, I was like, this is my story. And if you want it, you need to employ me to do it. Um, and so it's that sort of persistence and then uh, be kind as well, be kind because people really remember that and undervalue it and um, I think journalism uh, can get a bad rep and there are really, really, really nice, kind people that work in it and surround yourself with them. Thank you so much. I think we have a little bit of time to open the floor to some questions if there was anyone wanted to ask a question, just down there. Hi, thank you ladies, that was a really inspiring talk. I wrote it down because I just want to get it up. Um, Yomi, you mentioned this, that it's been a particularly shaky week in digital media, specifically talking about the layoffs at BuzzFeed. And I was wondering how stable you feel in this career, and where do you see the future of digital media going in the next decade or so? 
That is such a good question. Um, in terms of stability, um, I don't. Like, honestly, not at all. And I think, again, that's where imposter syndrome can really sort of rear its ugly head because you're seeing hugely, immensely talented journalists being laid off every week, not just at BuzzFeed, but pretty much everywhere. Um, and I've just very recently entered the freelance space um, because, um, essentially because of my book and just juggling the two wasn't really um, conducive. But sort of seeing the continued like layoffs and be, having been laid off myself actually, because as I said, the first place I ever worked, Viewpoint News, is no longer like it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so in terms of like stability, I I don't I guess I don't particularly feel stable. But I guess it's I'm in a weird kind of space at the moment because there are a lot of opportunities that are coming from. Um, essentially my book that are very, but in terms of journalistic opportunities, that's kind of feeding into that as well. Um, so I have sort of like recently started a few columns as I mentioned, and if it hadn't been for the book, then that those things wouldn't exist. But again, that's very precarious. Um, I'm sure um, a few of you are probably aware of what's been happening at the pool, which is where I used to work. I'm a woman's site and there's been all kinds of issues in terms of finance. So I had a column there that very abrupt, abruptly had to stop because of um, a lack of essentially finances. And it really does kind of keep you on edge and sort of keep, keep you on your toes because, you know, as everyone essentially becomes freelance, you start, you know, it becomes the fight to kind of get your story in front of the right editor and um, get it published and sort of get like commissions becomes sort of essentially like Hunger Games, like everybody's kind of going a bit mad. Um, but I'm not, as much as I don't necessarily feel stable as a millennial, <laughs> like I don't think millennials ever feel stable, like it, the housing crisis, 2008 economic financial crash. So I'm, I think I'm quite used to, I mean, I went into journalism never having, I've never, you know, I think I'm always quite interested in hearing about careers that have spanned anything more than sort of 10, <laughs> sort of five, 10 years. It's like, honestly fascinates me. And it's like, you know, I was at the BBC for like 15 years. I'm like, whoa, like, can't even imagine being in one place for more than four years. Not because I would want to move, but because I'd be made redundant, <laughs> essentially. But um, I, I'm not negative about the sort of future of journalism. Um, because we were having a sort of conversation the other day, me and some friends, about what it looks like. Some people have kind of been saying that they see subscription models, like, you know, there are loads of paywalls going up. I think Condé Nast is going completely sort of paywall by the end of the year. I think that's likely going to be, like, something that everybody essentially um, changes to. But somebody also made a good point that now as a generation, we're not used to the idea of buying one paper like you know like our parents did and buying the times buying the telegraph buying the guardian and that being our paper of choice because of political views we all kind of like read a little bit from buzzfeed read a little bit from wherever else and mix and match so somebody suggested something like a netflix subscription service that gave you sort of access to certain articles and i was like this is the only idea that's ever made sense like i, I just think it's i think i know it's quite specific but i do think that if it's not just going to be everybody totally going paywall and we just revert to what our parents did, I do think it's literally going to be some sort of subscription service that ag like accumulates all kinds of different articles under one platform and we all just pick and choose. But the way it is at the moment is completely unsustainable. But I hope that doesn't put anybody off because, I mean, I, I think the way it, things exist right now, it's, I mean, it's, it can be daunting, it can be scary, but I think at the end of the day, journalism's probably not been this important for several years. It's like the most crucial time for storytelling. So I'm just like, we really can't afford to lose any more journalists. <laughs> so everyone's got to keep going. Can I just quickly add to that? Because that's the world I live in right now. We're trying, my job is to try to build, try to find a new model for, yeah. <laughs> for news. Um, and I think, yeah, subscriptions are a lot of them, but there's a lot of membership models. So the idea of like creating cooperatives, creating them, co-creating them with people, with communities, again, um, a return to that relationship with people. Um, don't like put to the side not-for-profit news, which is where I work at the moment, but um, it's much bigger in the US, but um, there are ones in Europe and the UK that are, that are forming, and I think the models that are looking um, at the moment are around kind of almost as sort of as she was saying earlier, but but as a freelancer, but in, in organizations, which is they're doing lots of different revenue models. There's not one stream. It's not just coming from advertising anymore. We're looking at, like I said, some of that's going to come from membership, people who buy into the concept, the idea, to the belief, but you're also looking at different revenue streams. And I think this is actually how it used to, how it used to work in a lot of ways. But I think looking 
looking at ones, I believe the future is in sort of collaborative models and models that are very inclusive and models that bring people into the conversation. And that's something we're trying to build um, at the Bureau Local, but there's also lot, like really cool organizations in the UK that are doing it. The Bristol Cable is a co-op in, in Bristol. The Ferret is a, a, a one that's across Scotland. There's like really cool people that are starting stuff up and they're really successful because they've broken down that barrier between like, I am journalist with said power and you are reader that you will consume my writing and it's co-created. And I think, I just think there's so much in that in the future. Um, so I'd keep an eye out for that, those kind of models, which I think are really cool. I think there was a lady down the front who had her hand up. Um, I feel like I'm gonna be repeating um, <laughs> a little bit of what you said already. Um, Cause my question was really similar. It's also about um, digital media. Um, and I think you've, probably touched on it a lot. Um, my name's Ben Sackers. I built my own um, blog uh, for politics for young people. Um, and uh, I've done all my like writing just online and through like my own kind of like hard graphs and setting up my own stuff. Um, and basically, again, my question is really similar. Like, do you think there's more opportunity diverse wise um, in terms of digital media and just being able to create your own stuff and not waiting for somebody to tell you that you're good enough to make your content? You can just go out there and make your own videos, make your own content, write yourself. Are you optimistic in, in that sense? So yeah, I was gonna say absolutely. I, my first job in journalism was because essentially nobody wanted to give me a job or give me any opportunities to write. So um, somebody was like, why don't you just, especially about what I wanted to write about, which essentially pertained to like young black women. And they were like, why don't you just start your own magazine? And I was like, that's ludicrous. <laughs> like, why would I, I'm like, who am I? <laughs> like, why would I start my own magazine? But then there was a, um, company called um, O2 Think Big and another sort of platform called Vinspired that gave young people with ideas money. I don't even know if these sort of initiatives yeah, exist never, anymore. Oh, yeah, I hope so because it makes me want to yeah. cry. Yeah, you I'm can still like, get like grant funding and yeah, stuff like exactly. that. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's slightly more difficult because back then I quite literally was just like, I have this idea for this magazine. Can you give me some money? And they were like, okay. And like just loaded literally like a fake little debit card with like 500 pounds on it. And then another one gave the other one, um, I think it was Vinspired gave me 300 pounds. Um, so it was like, I essentially started up like a very short term, like non-profit, like young, a magazine that I used to distribute in hair shops in, South London um, called Birthday and it was aimed at like young black girls and um, essentially I just, I did, it was weirdly not my first kind of portfolio because I was just trying to show that like I could A, edit, I could write, I could edit, that I could manage a team, that I had ideas and that essentially I was talented because I had no means of showing that publicly because no one would employ me essentially. Um, so I'm super, as much as I kind of gave that really negative like overview <laughs> earlier, I'm re genuinely so, um, positive because I also think what the internet's done is shown that there is a drive and hunger for those kind of stories I think before it was very easy to kind of like gaslight everybody and, and be like all we care about is you know certain stories but now because of like you know analytics and data we're able to kind of track that no actually people you know if you put out a video and it gets 33,000 like views that can't be like what's what it can't be gamed or tricked and to be fair actually you can like buy followers and stuff but what i mean is generally <laughs> analytics tend to show that you know like um previously ignored groups are like super hungry for representation and just for their stories to be told and it's why you know you get panel shows like there's a panel show like called back chat london which is essentially supposed to like um it's it's a very controversial very much divided like um black panel show however it's done really well from primarily because it's provided representation that other kind of like reality TV shows and other kind of like documentaries and stuff don't about just young black British people. And it's got like masses of fans all over the country just because there's literally nothing rivaling it, especially on the main in the mainstream. So yeah, I think I'm massively um, optimistic. If it hadn't been the internet, I always say I don't think I'd have been a journalist. Like you, I had no kind of previous, um, like I'd only just written online and it's only very recently my stuff's been sort of in print because before it's like every single platform I'd worked on had been online and I don't think that's a bad thing to be honest, I think it's the future. It's about being um, tenacious, isn't it? And not waiting for someone else's approval. Give yourself the permission to express yourself creatively and carve out your own opportunities for yourself. Because that's what I did, you know, I used to just, I was like, there's this event going on, there's going to have an amazing group of people there, I want to get access to that. So I'd just get myself access to the awards do, Screen Nation Awards. Idris Elba was up for an award, I was like, that is my mission tonight to interview Idris Elba. And I'm not going to ask him, oh, you're going to do Luther again. I'm going to ask him, as a black actor that's British, 
what could British broadcasters and producers learn from what the US are doing so well in nurturing talent? Because we're seeing a lot of British talent migrating to the US. What would you like to say to them? And when I asked him that, his face lit up. He literally was like, yes, you're so engaged in what's happening here. And in that moment, I sat there just listening to him thinking, you've created this entire situation because you had that fire in your belly. You didn't ask permission, you just went for it. And look at the substance you're getting now. And I took that to ITV and to the BBC, and then that led to more opportunities. So don't ask for permission, just go for it. Any more questions? There was a lady at the back there, just put her hand up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> One and then two. Am I okay to start? Yeah, yeah, okay. go ahead. Hey, uh, my name is Diora, and I've got a question for Yomi. So I'm a staff writer, and I'm the only woman of color in my team, which is quite shocking, considering I'm quite white passing. I often feel like I'm the token woke person, and also feel like a lot of people go around and ask me to check their stories um, to see if anything in there is like potentially problematic in terms of like racism or anything else. This is often quite tiring, and I feel like the people around me just don't want to do their own learning and education. How you ever had this experience and how do you feel, deal with it? Um, yes, definitely. And I've also several times been the only woman of color, black person in like an entire organization. Um, and it can be very sort of draining. Um, I've sometimes been like the only woman, like so it's been, it can be super sort of intense. Um, in terms of how to deal with it, especially that sort of like fact checking thing, it really, for me, it really goes two ways because on the one hand it's super draining and I, I really am at times I just like Google is free like you can you can really just check like you, do you know what I mean but on the other hand it's like because I was talking about that sort of issue with like sort of a lack of diverse sub editors and how it can have really seriously like horrible consequences for like um, minority writers and just generally even for the kind of um, reputation of a publication um, I it's it's a really hard balance to draw because sometimes, um, for instance, there was a um, time when when I was at a woman's site, um, they'd asked me to sort of write about like a beauty hack or something, just to sort of like a few lines, and I was like, yeah, sure, and I was like, oh, my beauty hack is olive oil, I love it, like it's great, you, you can use it in your hair, you can use it in your skin, whatever. And then I made a joke about how you could use it in cooking, as well, and it was just this multi-purpose thing, and because nobody'd asked me. Um, about what I'd been talking about, even though I said, even though I just kind of said olive oil, because there's a particular sort of hairspray called olive oil by this brand called o ORS, which is like a specifically black brand, they just assumed that I meant the spray, which is like a really toxic hairspray that meant that I was telling people to cook with, <laughs> to cook with this toxic hairspray. So, and I only saw it because a black picture editor had gone sis are you sure this is what <laughs> are you sure this is what you mean is this the accompanying image and I was like of course not and I was like next time just ask me and um and I do often say like you know when I see really stupid headlines or I see really like obvious like misinterpretations of someone's work I do often say ask a minority friend like ask your black friend ask your Asian friend because you won't make these mistakes so I have no kind of clear answer because on the one hand it really isn't your burden, you're not being paid extra to go over people's work, you're really not, and you absolutely shouldn't feel obliged to do that. I think it's just more, I suppose, yeah, it's really up to you and what makes you feel comfortable, because there have been, there have been several times where people have been like, oh, can you do this? And I'm like, look, I'm busy, I've got my own work to do, like, and, and this is what people always kind of talk about in terms of microaggressions and just being a minority at work, and that's a minority in any way. So much of your job isn't just doing your job, it becomes about, policing like other people's work and then kind of like trying to navigate through microaggressions and it gets really tiring so it's really hard it's it really is just kind of up to you and what you feel comfortable with because you to be honest it's thankless work you're not going to be paid any more for it but in the kind of name of journalism and accuracy sometimes it really is important it happens but I'm not saying that because it's it, I'm saying that you should do it it's it, it's just that kind of thing of uh, sometimes I'll read a really brilliant story and there's just a throwaway line that I know is going to make it go viral in all the wrong ways and I just have to kind of step in and be like, look, like, you know, for the greater good, let's <laughs> let's just take this out. But, um, yeah, it, I mean, 
you know, not to plug my book, but in our book, <laughs> we do mention that, you know, there is no one way of kind of dealing with these things. You get some people that are like, they take an educative approach, other people that just tend to ignore things. And, you know, um, I just think it's something that you know you're gonna face at pretty much every stage of your career. So it's very important that you just kind of decide what you're comfortable with. And if you're like, that's not within my remit and I don't wanna be this token person, that's absolutely fine. You're genuinely not obliged to do anything that's outside of what you signed up to in your like sort of job description. One more question just down the back there. Hi there. Um, I actually have so many questions for you all, and I've been sitting here stressing about which one to ask. But I'm going to pick one about storytelling, which is probably more relevant from like an investigative journalism and documentary production point of view. Um, to give some context, I'm currently trying to make a documentary about the diverse stories of women living in Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Kyrgyzstan, which are countries that few people in England tend to know much about. Talk to me afterwards because <laughs> I, I know will. quite a lot about that. <laughs> so my, my question is, what advice do you have about taking stories which are interesting but unfamiliar and perhaps difficult to relate to and making them accessible and um, bringing them to life for a wider audience? Well, I've, I've, I've spent quite a long time. I mean, we all, we all, I mean, we all have stories about, about that. I've spent a lot of, lot of time in huge debates at the BBC. I mean, you know, apparently foreign affairs is not that interesting to British audiences, but actually they are incredibly important uh, because what's happening in a, you know, in a refugee camp in Lebanon right now will have effects to all of us. I mean, the Brexit vote on, you know, the, the incredible fear of the migrants. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a domino effect of all the stories. I mean, we're all human. I mean, the story in Tajikistan, I mean, I, I have worked on a lot of uh, films with Simon Reeves where we looked at the t about tea, for instance. I did a film called On the Tea Trail and we looked at the production of, of tea, of black tea that, uh, on PJ Tips. And we tracked PJ Tips from production in Rwanda and in Kenya through human stories along the line. And through that, we looked at um, truck stops where AIDS and prostitution uh, ferments um, in Kenya. We looked at children in, um, in tea, tea plantations that are picking tea leaves because half of their, parent, or their parents are no longer there because of AIDS. We looked at all these extraordinary human stories just through the prism of tea. You know, and you can do something extraordinary in Tajikistan or in Uzbekistan, you know, um, on, I, I, we, we can talk about that another time, but I've got a, an incredible investigative journalist in Tajikistan. I was asked to panel on good governance, and we looked at, um, we looked at small stories about, um, we looked at ISIS, we looked at the mountains, we looked at skiing in Tajikistan. And through skiing, we found extraordinary stories in the mountains that everyone here maybe can, I mean, no, you know, if you're interested in sports or whatever, or we looked at women paragliders in Mosul who told an extraordinary story. I mean, there's so many extraordinary stories you can tell about something that's relatable to us. And I think you have to keep pushing for those stories because they're super interesting. I mean, you have done quite a few with our world as well. I think there's an absolute uh, need today to make the world that is so global, you know, where people turn away because they're not, they say they're not that interested, they're more interested in what's happening in their backyard, but their backyard is, is, is all of our backyard, it's the world. Yeah. So don't be afraid of pitching stories, but find something unique that we can relate to. I mean, you know, um, yeah, it can be something quite quirky about, you know, about, um, so, yeah, something that we can all relate to and then make that story, but, but push for it because I think it's essential that foreign affairs news continues because it's relevant, it will always be relevant, especially today. I think we're going to close the panel there because we have gone over slightly, but thank you guys so, so much, honestly. <laughs>